Follow your muse, we tell artists. Follow the money, we urge the rest. But what if pursuing our creative tendencies leads us to that hidden treasure? Increasingly, the spark of innovation is driving real economic success in our region. Even as we lament the loss of jobs overseas, a number of imaginative entrepreneurs are adding billions of dollars in benefits to our economy. One of them is a world-famous photographer. The other is building an ice cream empire. Together, they'll explain how to cultivate both passion and profit. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Molly Moon didn't start out as an entrepreneur. She spent her 20s working in politics. But then she decided she wanted to be her own boss. But of what? Molly remembered her passion for ice cream and opened her own shop. There are now five Molly Moon storefronts across Seattle. Last year, it was recognized as King County's Small Business of the Year. Yet even as Molly delights Seattleites with her ice cream, she also says that her business continues to embody her politics. Molly, welcome. Thank you. So, Pacific Northwest, known for coffee and for rain and cool weather. What possessed you or inspired you to think that ice cream was the way to go? Well, I really felt like Seattle needed a good ice cream shop. I had lived in Seattle since 2001, and it was 2007, and I was writing my business plan, and I just knew that it needed a good ice cream shop, and an ice cream shop that not only had a great product, but also could be the kind of multi-generational community gathering place that I know ice cream shops in other cities are. So when you look at, say, an ice cream shop versus, say, a coffee shop, mm -hmm. what, what, ga what, what kind of vibe gathers around a, an ice cream shop versus, say, a coffee shop? There is a whole lot more talking in an ice cream shop. Really? Oh, yeah. Because nobody's at their laptops that are staring at there a screen, There are no right? laptops. There's no working. It's all about fun. And there are a lot more two-year-olds involved. Well, that's good. <laughs> so did you think that Seattle needed an ice cream shop because of the ice cream itself, or did you actually also want to bring that, that cultural ethic as well that was sort of lacking? It was definitely both of those things. I really wanted an ice cream shop in Seattle that I wanted to go to. I'm sort of an ice cream addict. It's my favorite dessert. And I didn't have a place that I would want to go, and I knew a lot of other people would share that sentiment, but also, Growing or being in Seattle in my 20s, I noticed that everyone that I encountered in Seattle was close to my age. Right. And that got kind of frustrating to me. And I grew up in a really multi-generational setting where I was always around little cousins or my little sister and grandparents and aunts and uncles. And in Seattle, it seemed a lot more segregated, like families don't hang out where the hipsters hang out, et cetera. So I wanted my ice cream shop to sort of be a place where college kids might go after class, you know, young professionals or hipsters might go on a date, but families could go, families with teenagers could go, and you know, I've, I've been told by a lot of parents that it's one of the only times my teenager will talk to me. Wow. And empty nesters love ice cream too, I mean, it really crosses the generations. I mean, and it, is it just ice cream or is there something about your store that gets people to open up like that? Well, I think I tried to create a really welcoming, fun environment that, you know, the music is important to me. The design of the space is really important to me. The friendliness of my staff is important to me. But ice cream is a big part. I mean, everybody has a great ice cream memory. That's great. So when you open that first store, what was what were you thinking? I mean, it's. It, I think they were looking at even 2007 or 2008, right? The economy was not in great shape. Actually, it was awesome. When I was writing my business plan in 2007, if you remember, everything felt on the up, and really things didn't start feeling terrible until a month or two after I opened my first shop. <laughs> and how did you feel when you opened your first shop? Sales were amazing. They were much higher than I had projected, and so I just sort of crossed my fingers and kept going. And I also read when I was when I was writing the business plan that ice cream is one of the most recession-proof businesses you can get into. Because it's a 
because it's a cheap treat. And you know, when you can't buy your kid a new bike or you can't take your family on vacation, I think you're gonna treat them to smaller treats. So you might go to the ice cream store a little more often. Well, so that's interesting to me because I think even Starbucks really almost fell off the map at that time. And coffee in many ways is meant to be that indulgence that mm -hmm. makes you feel good. But there must be something really wonderful about ice cream that as you say is much more cross-generational, right? You mm -hmm. can't give your three-year-old a coffee. Right. Or you shouldn't give your coffee. So. Right, yeah. And I mean, what do you think is more indulgent? A scoop of salted caramel with hot fudge or a latte? So, I mean, you, if, if that's the case, if ice cream is that important, what is, do you have an ice cream memory yourself since ice cream has been part of your life for so long? Oh, absolutely. So when I was a kid, my grandparents watched me in the summers and my mom's parents, John and Faye Pengilly, owned a saloon, like an, a Cheers kind of situation, old timey saloon. Where is this? In, in Boise, Idaho. And my mom would drop me off with them in the mornings they would collect the bank deposit from the night before and they had a routine. They, we went to the bank, we deposited the money at the bank, I got a sucker from the drive through teller, then we went to the grocery store. I don't know why they needed to go to the grocery store every day, but they did. And at that point, Grandpa and I would head to the deli section where they had ice cream and Grandma would continue into the store to buy whatever groceries they needed. Grandpa would get a cone of strawberry ice cream on a cake cone and I would get a kid's scoop of German chocolate cake ice cream on a sugar cone every day of the summer, almost my entire childhood. Wow. Yeah. So you've always loved ice cream and you've yeah. associated with that incredible memory. Yeah. So how did you make that conversion in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit to sort of say, you know what, my love for ice cream could actually be something that I make a living from? Well, I didn't really come up with that idea myself. I was sort of whining to my mom in the fall of 2006, um, I was still working in politics and I was trying to figure out my next move and she reminded me that I love ice cream and that I know how to make ice cream because I had worked in a little homemade ice cream shop all of my college career at, in Missoula, Montana at a shop called The Big Dipper. And she was sort of reminding me like, Molly, you know how to do this and you would love it and you'd get to be around kids, which is important to me and you could probably make a living at it. It seems like the Big Dipper did really well, so. What did you tell her the I, first week? I was like, Mom, you've, you know, you're the best, of <laughs> course, and you have great ideas, and I'm gonna get started on that. Wow, so, so there was no resistance whatsoever. You said, no. I'm doing this. No, it was a great idea. Was it hard to say goodbye to the thing that you actually seemed to love the most before in your 20s, which was politics? No. And how, how did you reconcile yourself then to sort of say, this is my new life? Well, my whole goal getting out of politics, I, I was the executive director of a political nonprofit that worked with bands to register their fans to vote. So it was sort of one foot in the music industry, one foot in, the pol in politics. Neither of those industries are the most wholesome, may I say, yes. at times. And I really wanted to do something a little more wholesome. I wanted to think about putting down roots. I traveled all over the country for that job. And I wanted to do something where I could still embody my politics, but not really be a part of the fundraising rat race and the craziness of the music industry. So it just, it all seemed to make sense. And I knew that I could write a business plan for an ice cream shop that embodied my political values in a number of ways. So how does that work now then? How does politics go into ice cream? Well, when I wrote my business plan, I said, I'm not going to open it unless I can run it in a way that makes me feel good about all of my politics being involved. For instance, I am going to pay 100% of the health care premiums for all of my employees. And I'm going to use only compostable materials to serve everything in. And I'm going to use only reclaimed wood for everything that I can possibly use in the shops. I'm going to build my shops as green as I can. I'm going to be as socially responsible as I can and environmentally responsible as I can with all the ingredients sourcing. That's expensive. This is what a lot of business people complain about that the government imposes upon them. And you did this willingly. Yeah. And you're making money? Well, I sort of said to myself when I was writing the plan that I would write the plan the way that I really wanted to run a business. And if the numbers at the bottom of the plan turned out black, I would go ahead. If they turned out red, I was going to have to stay a political consultant. 
and they turned out black. They were black. And I opened my first shop in Wallingford the spring of 2008, and I did way better than I thought I would. And we've continued to do, you know, we've really continued to exceed projections. You have stores in Wallingford, Capitol Hill, Queen Anne, uh, Madrona, Madrona, and downtown. And downtown. Relatively all. And an ice cream truck. An ice cream truck going all over the place. Those five locations are fairly affluent areas. Mm -hmm. When you consider your politics, which it really is about, you know, being an all encompassing um, kind of situation, why don't you have a store, say, in the Central District? That's a really good question. I mean, I did my, my market research about where ice cream sells, and I went to those neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods are, you know, higher than average household income, higher than average kids per household. So those are the zip codes I'm in. Um, I'd love to be in some other neighborhoods, but I needed to establish my business to be strong financially first in order to expand into areas that may not be as profitable. And, but you probably will at some point once you do get at that, that level. Uh, now, I have to admit that I live in the Queen Anne area, so I'm one of those people. And I, I visited the Queen Anne store with my daughter, and she chose your, I think it's called Scout Mint. So this is my daughter. <laughs> so cute. And she was just, she, I surprised her that we were going there after preschool, and she absolutely loved it. And as we were leaving, she just was, we were on the street together, and she just put her hands up in the air, and she said, I love Molly Moon. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably used to that kind of reaction from kids. I'm very popular with the under five crowd. <laughs> what does that translate into? Just good sales, or do you feel like you have sort of building some kind of special relationship? Run, I, run for somehow. office, and they all turn 18. It'll really work out for me, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> so um, you have done something quite amazing. You've, you've followed your passion, something that you've loved all your life. You've been, sounds like you have success right off the bat, and it embodies your values. Do you think that you actually have a teachable lesson for other people who are considering entrepreneurialism? Can you teach what, can you teach your success? I think there are lessons to be learned. I don't know that anyone can replicate what I've done um, with their own passions, but I think, gosh, that's hard for me. I don't really like giving advice yeah. that much. Um, I think for the most part, it is good to follow what you believe in, and it's great to make something other than money your first bottom line. Well, the money has to make sense, but I don't think it should be your only motivator. Well, that's interesting because when you hear, especially big businesses talk, because they're held by shareholders and their first thing is to make money back for the shareholders, mm -hmm. profit has to be their motivation plus growth. But you're saying that profit doesn't necessarily need to be the first priority. Well, no. I, I, I think that you do have a fiduciary. I have investors. I have a fiduciary responsibility to those investors. And I understand big businesses that say we have to make money. but you can make something else your goal, and financial reward can be an outcome of that. I think what we get frustrated in is that big businesses' only goal is money, and they don't really have a goal for serving their customers or serving their communities. That's where things get hard. Like I can't see what the goal is for most insurance companies other than making money. I think that's terrific, and I think we're beginning to hear more of that. Even Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, recently said that he thought that profit should be tactical, which means that profit is the means to the end, that you should actually grow your company around the values. The money should actually make that happen. Obviously, you should make a profit, but it shouldn't be the overarching priority, and I think that's what I'm hearing here as well. Yeah. Well, that's great. So when you um, look at your long-range plan, I mean, you've been very successful. You're growing your storefronts. This could go on for a while. For many entrepreneurs, the ultimate, especially here in the Wild West, is the payout, right? To sell out to a larger company and, and, and go off. And, you know, this happened to Ben and Jerry's with Unilever bought them out. Have you thought about your legacy? Yeah, I have no exit plan. I love running my company. I love creating jobs. One of my big goals now is each year that I write a strategic plan for the company, how many jobs can our projects create? And that gives me a lot of fulfillment, it gives me a lot of joy, and I feel like I'm the best to run the company to embody you know, the progressive values on which I founded it. And I can't see not being involved in the company. I'm, I know I'll have to grow it and have other people make decisions and delegate, but I'll probably be involved my whole life. So if you're there for life, 
and I hate to take you this far, <laughs> what would you like, what would you, I mean, say 100 years from now, mm -hmm. what do you think about Molly Moon 100 years from now? Can it be run by somebody else? Can it still exist, or is it just you? I'm sure it could exist. I don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, yeah. hopefully I've got another 60 years or so in Absolutely. me. Absolutely, especially with all that healthy ice cream. Yeah. And, and how many people do you actually employ right now? Uh, I employ about 60 people. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a heck of a contribution. Do you feel like maybe you're making more of a contribution to the values now than you were in your 20s because you are embodying these values and bringing profit in the, to the economy itself? Um, I think it's hard to compare. Like. I think what I was contributing to the world in my 20s working in politics was, you know, we registered 90,000 young voters who ended up helping win the Democrats' elections in 2006. That's I feel like that's a little bit bigger impact than the ice cream, but you know, we'll my see daughter, where I my can daughter take would it. beg to differ. Yeah. <laughs> so when we return, who would give up a sure thing of a career in medicine to pursue photography? Our next guest did, and by successfully doing so, he has helped us see the world in his own unique way. The digital revolution has turned communications upside down. It poses challenges and opportunities to professionals seeking to influence and persuade. These are our students in the Master of Communication and Digital Media program innovators who think entrepreneurially about how to engage communities through storytelling. As creative leaders, together we're charting the future of communication. Want to join us? Find out more at mcdm.uw.edu.